All right, well, good morning once again. And, uh, well, the Lord, the Lord reminded me this morning that he doesn't forget us. God doesn't forget us. In fact, he remembered us when we cared nothing for him, and he continues to remember us. But your pastor forgets things. I forgot to pray for Margaret. <laughs> so I'd like, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to pray for her now, and should she listen to this recording, she knows that we actually prayed for her. <laughs> so, she get, so this is uh, something of a habit now. I forget to pray for somebody, and then they get immortalized on MP3. So let's pray for Margaret together as a, as a church family, okay? Father, in Jesus' name, we do come to your grace, your throne of grace, uh, to ask you, Lord, to, to remember Margaret. We lift her up to you, Lord. Uh, she has need, and we ask that you take care of her deepest need. We pray, Lord, that you restore health to her body where health is wanting. We pray, Lord, that you meet her material needs where there is a shortage of money. We pray especially, Lord, that you would flood her soul and spirit with your love and truth and that that would flood into her home to whatever place she goes to. We pray that Jesus would be there with her and that she would be a light in the world, a bold, effective witness for Christ a testimony to his faithfulness and his goodness. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we are in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And remember, uh, I'd mentioned Deuteronomy 4, I think, last time. I said, impossible to summarize this chapter. Just impossible to synopsize the thing. So I'm not even going to try. We're just going to preach our way through Deuteronomy chapter 4. And we are going to put in at verse 23. So Deuteronomy 4, 23. And I just want to let God's word talk to us. I just want to read up to verse 40. And, um, and then we're going to talk about it. Because there's so much here that we need to think about. It's relevant to our day. Even, even in 2017, this is very relevant. So let's uh, begin reading now. Verse 23 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses speaking to Israel, and yet lessons here for us. Verse 23, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And we covered that last week. Remember when God descended on Mount Sinai in fire? fire that re reached to the midst of heaven, and he spoke to those people. He reminded them, you saw no image of me. I didn't sh show you my form, because I don't want you trying to make images of me. No carvings, no paintings, no images that you're going to bow down to and pray to. Again, you see this, this over and over again, it keeps popping up. Don't make images of me. There's only one legi legitimate image of the invisible God, and that's who? The Lord Jesus the image of the invisible God. Verse 25, When you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image, there's that image again, in the form of anything, and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which, which you cross over uh, the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be few, uh, left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And when you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days, note that, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which you swore to them. For ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether anything like this has happened or anything like it has been heard. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and live? 
Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation? By trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand with an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To know, or to you it was shown, uh, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God and that there is none other besides him. For out of heaven he let you hear his voice, that he might instruct you on earth. He showed you his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he brought you up out of Egypt with his presence and with his mighty power, driving out from before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in, to give you their land as an inheritance as it is this day. Therefore, know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on earth beneath, and there is no other. And you shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and your children after you, that they may prolong your days, or that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. Wow, what an incredible passage of Scripture. Absolutely jam-packed with meaning. Beautiful, powerful reminders from God, promises from God. We learn about God and his uniqueness. We learn something about his plans and purposes for Israel. He, there's some prophecy there. All kinds of things for us to be thinking about this morning. Where do we start? I think we should start where the Bible starts. In the beginning, God. God is always the place to start. He's the start he is the place to start all your reasoning. You're, if you're asking any question, whatever, God is the first place to go looking for an answer. You say, Lord, I just read a very long passage of Scripture here. Where should I start? Start with God. What did we learn about God here? Well, we learn one thing. There is no other. The God of Israel is the God of gods. Now, the Bible has to tell us that many times, doesn't it? Because why? Because the human heart is... Uh, born into the world with a natural inborn hostility to the true God, and there needs to be a conversion because we will deny, suppress, and corrupt the truth about God that God has revealed to every heart unless we're regenerated. That's just what man does. That's what fallen man does. The Bible teaches a strict, uncompromising monotheism. There is only one God who is God by nature. Elsewhere in the Bible, uh, Paul, for instance, tells us that uh, there are many gods out there, sure. Yeah, wood, hay, stubble, stone, straw, whatever. Just name it all. You can, all. you can call them all gods if you want to. But Galatians 4 is very clear. There is only one God who is God by nature. There's only one God who inhabits eternity. There's only one sovereign God who's the king of eternity. There is only one God who has all great making properties and attributes to an infinite degree. And that's the triune God of the Bible. Major, major teaching in the Bible. Major teaching. And that is one of the things that set Israel apart from her pagan neighbors. She had only one God, the Creator. And she didn't look to other gods she wasn't supposed to. One God for her. Her, her neighbors were absolutely supersaturated in polytheism, the belief in many gods. Uh, there was gods of the mountains and gods of the valleys, Local regional deities, they're in charge in this area, see? Babylon had their regional deities. Storm gods, for example, gods that look after certain areas of the created order. But no one sovereign, all-controlling God. That was Israel's God. And she was forbidden from bowing down to other lesser divinities. And that is a major teaching throughout the entire Bible. In fact, Psalm 96 and verse 5 reads this. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens and the earth. That is the argument that Jeremiah advances. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah ha was given a prophecy to tell the Israel's pagan neighbors. And this is it. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from under these heavens and from off of this earth. That was the, that was the message to the pagan gods and to those that followed them. In Jeremiah 10.10, 10, the prophet tells us very clearly that our God, the God of Israel, and by extension, the God of eternity, the God of the created order, the God who controls all things, 
He is the true God. He is the living God. He is the everlasting king. And, and you know what that means? Just draw out the conclusion. That means all his competitors are false, they're dead, and they're finite. Thank you. There's only one God who is God by nature, and that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God just had to go on repeating himself on this because Israel had a terrible problem with worshiping lesser divinities, created things. And that's man's problem even to this very hour, isn't it? We talked about that last week. And you know what? Even in the life of the Christian, things compete for the throne. Things compete for authority, for final authority in our lives. Our own sensibilities sometimes want to eclipse God's clear commandments to us. Isn't that true? And you say, God, my heart is so involved in this. I just know that what, I'm, what I want to do is right here. I just know it. And God says, trust me, dear child. I know you better than you know yourself. And I know that if you go through with this, this is going to be a disaster for you. You listen to God. You remember Proverbs 3? Trust in the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, and lean what? Not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And that, you know, the Bible has to multiply references to that effect because we're so stubborn and slow to learn, and the, the, the easiest person to deceive in our lives is ourselves. Isn't it true? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We all must bend our knee to the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus and his lordship and the bar of scripture to order our thoughts and our actions aright. And that's hard sometimes. And you say, God, help me. And that's the way to go. You say, God, help me. I can't do this on my own. So first of all, in this long passage we read, we read that Israel was to observe a strict, uncompromising monotheism, a faith commitment to the one true and only God. The second thing, of course, we are reminded of Israel's unique relationship with that God. Uh, there were several verses there where uh, a rhetorical question was brought to us. Has God ever dealt with a nation like he dealt with this one? Has he ever descended in fire upon the mountain and gave commandments to a nation like he dealt with Israel? And the answer, of course, is no. Israel is unique in the plans and purposes of God. In these Old Testament times, Israel was God's unique channel of revelation and blessing to the world. And so we read in the Bible about God's supernatural election of that nation, her supernatural birth, and her unique redemptive history. And you know what? That's kind of like you, too. You were elected by God, too, you know. You were called by God. You have a unique redemptive history, too. Uh, very often when people discover that I've been speaking on apologetics for some time, they will approach me. I had it happen this past weekend. We were in Saskatchewan. I was speaking at a, um, a pastor's retreat. And uh, sure enough, someone approaches me and says, how do you answer a person who has this kind of worldview? Or how do you talk to youth who are thinking like this? And I have to tell the man, look, the best I can give you is some general comments here to this, because there are no cookie-cutter approaches to evangelism and apologetics. Why is that? Because God d didn't make carbon copies of people. He made unique, precious, beautiful, individual human souls. And everybody's conversion story is a little different than everybody else's, isn't it? And the way God got a hold of me is different from the way he got a hold of you. You have a unique story too. Israel was unique among the nations. Guess what? You're unique among people. Spe special, precious, little jewel on planet earth. No one qu quite like you under God. And God made you that way. He gets the credit, right, for making you who you are. All the good things that we can say about you, and I'm sure, friends, and I know you folks, some better than others, and I know that I have a long list of good things to say about every one of you. But we all agree Jesus is responsible, right? <laughs> Not on our own strength. But um, it's important. It's important that we don't start looking at our local assembly or the church universal as an amorphous blob. No, it's a mosaic made of special individual people, elected, called, converted by God with their unique place in God's plans and purposes. Israel was that amongst the nations, and you're that amongst the people. And that's kind of important. 
Well, the third thing we could say about this long passage uh, is something about Israel's future. Israel has a future. I have to say that because even within mainstream Christendom, there is this idea that national ethnic Israel has been totally set aside forever in the plans and purposes of God. The church has replaced her. All the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament that extend far into the future have nothing to do with national ethnic Israel. It has only to do with the church. And friends, I simply don't believe that. And it's not my purpose to launch off into a, into a, you know, a, hundred part series on eschatology right now but we should learn some things about the end times because this is what our text talks about remember in verse 30 take a look at verse 30 when you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days when you turn to the lord your god and obey his voice for the lord your god is a merciful god he will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them Israel, God is not done with Israel. We're just going to put it that way. And I think it's very interesting that as you go to the New Testament, the only Gentile writer in the New Testament is whom? Anyone remember? Dr. Luke. He wrote two wonderful books, fantastically important books, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And he is, the, as far as we could tell, the only Gentile writer of a biblical book, and he has a lot to say about national ethnic Israel especially in the opening chapters of the book of Luke. God has not forsaken the people whom he has foreknown. That's what Paul tells us. Uh, we have wonderful promises there in the opening chapters of Luke that Jesus will come and sit on the throne of his father David. Now that is an earthly throne. That is an earthly throne over an earthly people named Israel. God's not done. But Israel, for now, has really been set aside in the plan of God. We're living in a very strange time in earth history. It's called the age of grace, or it's called the church age. For her rebellion and dis disobedience, Israel has been set aside now. And this mysterious age has now come upon the world. The prophets of the Old Testament didn't know about it. Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter 3. It was unknown to the prophets that the Gentiles should be made fellow heirs of the promises of God. And we're living in those days of grace right now. Until what? Until the times of the Gentiles have come in. The fullness of the Gentiles have come in. And so Israel, as punishment for her rebellion and her stubbornness and her hard-heartedness, dispersed amongst the nations. Exile and dispersion. The Gentiles came in to the land of Israel, invaded it, conquered it, subjugated the people, in fact, dispersed the people. Exile and dispersion. And that, friends, is another major, major theme in the Bible. And you're just not going to understand the Bible aright unless you've got Israel right. Israel was God's special people, a light bearer to the nations. And when Israel disobeyed God and rebelled against God and went after other lesser gods and adopted the horrible practices of her neighbors, God chose as his means of punishment it would be gentile oppression against israel that's what he promised he said you rebel against me you adopt the practices of the pagans around you and you're going to experience gentile aggression violence and oppression that's what you're going to experience israel and it won't be fun for you in fact the bible gets very graphic about this there are verses in our survey of the bible that i will not read audibly on a Sunday morning behind a pulpit. It's just too ghastly. It's just too horrible. But that was God's means of punishing, chastening Israel. He said, Israel, you're going to be an object lesson to the nations that I don't tolerate sin and hardness of heart and disobedience from you. And you're going to experience harsh Gentile aggression, violence, and oppression. A major, major theme in the Bible. You say, well, why did God do that? Well, friends, everything points to Jesus. Everything points to him. Think about Jesus. He is called God's elect, just like Israel is called God's elect. Israel was to be a light bearer to the nations, a special channel of revelation and blessing. Guess what? 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into the world. He is the exclusive channel of revelation and blessing to the world. 
And Jesus, though he were innocent and did not have a hard heart against God, did not rebel, did not stiffen his neck against God, nevertheless, guess what he experienced? Gentile aggression, violence, and oppression. How about that? And the supreme example of that is that they nailed him to a tree. He was punished for our transgressions. You remember that? He was bruised for our iniquities. And God has laid on him the, the iniquity of, our, of us all. See that? I mean, it's just all spelled out for, for us all in spectacular fashion, and you just kind of want to put your hand over your mouth and not talk when you're in the presence of a truth like that, revealed by God. And you say, God, I'm learning so many important things here, I can hardly stand it. I'm learning that you really love us. You know, there's disobedient Israel, and she gets punished just the way God said. And here comes the innocent Lamb of God, and he gets punished as though he were the most vile sinner that ever lived. Horrible, horrible. And you read about it in the book of Samuel, and God makes some promises to David the king. He says, your son, when he rebels against me, I will chasten him. He'll be beaten with the rods. I'll make a show of him, and he will learn. And there, a thousand years later, comes Jesus, and he is beaten with rods, and he gets the thorns, thorns jammed on his head, and he gets scourged in the street. I mean, people are watching this happen, and they're learning something. They're, see they're seeing that the carpenter from Nazareth is being treated like he is a guilty Judean king. You see? And it all points to Jesus, his great love for us, and the awfulness of sin and rebellion against God, the awfulness of it, the tragedy of it. That's why, friends, we've got to be very serious about this. When, you, when you're going to make a life-changing decision, you don't say, well, I think I'll follow my heart. This just seems like the right thing to do. No, you go to, the, you go to the bar of Scripture and you listen to what God has to say about this. And you don't make excuses for why you're not going to listen to Him. It's an awful tragedy when you do. It'll be horrible for you, and Jesus displayed the awfulness of sin and rebellion there at the cross. And in fact, the awfulness of sin and rebellion is there all throughout Israel's rebellious history. And we say, God, help us to not make these mistakes. Let's not do that. Well, we learned something about Israel's history here, but we learned something about Israel's redemption too in the latter days. In the latter days. The Bible promises that Israel one day will truly repent as a nation, national, ethnic Israel, as a people, will finally experience the unveiling of who Christ really, really is. Their eyes will no longer be blind, their ears will no longer be deaf, and they will truly repent. It'll be a true repentance, not that phony baloney repentance at Kadesh Barnea. Remember that one? Crocodile tears. They didn't really, didn't really mean it. They were still following their own uh, evil desires. They were still going to rebel against God. They were still uh, attempting to operate autonomously. Self-determination. No, in the future, it'll be a different thing. They will truly repent. True repentance, and guess what? True restoration for the nation. That's what will happen. This is what the Bible promises. Israel now is hardened and in a state of unbelief. Set aside in the plans of God. Yes, the church has taken the stage. And one day the Bible promises that there will be a time of unprecedented horror and tribulation on this earth. It's called tribulation, the great one. Jesus talks about it. Jeremiah talked about it. Jeremiah called it the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel the prophet called it the 70th week. It was a prophecy for God's covenant people, Israel. They will experience this horrible time on planet Earth. Horrible, horrible Gentile aggression against God's people Israel during that time. And Satan incarnate will take center stage in the government system that will then dominate the world. We call that man Antichrist. Unprecedented horror. But during that time, you'll see a revived Israel restored loving their Messiah, Jesus. In fact, Revelation chapter 7 says there will be a missionary team such as the world has never seen before come out of Israel. 144,000 Jewish evangelists to tell the world about Jesus, probably empowered and equipped by God's special messengers, the two witnesses, 
in Revelation chapter 11. And at the end of the tribulation, there will be Israel. The nations gathered around her. She looks helpless. She looks weak. She looks ripe for extermination. And right when the dark, darkness has gotten as deep as it can get, the greatest light the world has ever known will suddenly break upon the created order. And the Lord Jesus will descend from the third heaven with ten thousands of his saints to rescue and restore his redeemed people, Israel. And he will put down all military opposition first, and he will establish his kingdom. He will judge the nations. He will separate the, sh the nations like a shepherd separates sheep and goats. And to those on his right, he will say, Come, inherit the kingdom prepared from my Father, from the foundation of the world for you. And to the goats, he will say, Depart from me, go into everlasting fire. He will even judge his people Israel. And Ezekiel 20 says, He will purge out the rebels from among them. He will make Israel pass under the rod. And the rebels are consigned to darkness. And those who are redeemed amongst Israel will enter the kingdom prepared for them. A beautiful thousand-year millennial reign of Christ on the earth where the world is restored to Eden-like conditions once again. No more war. No more deceptions from Satan. He's consigned to the pit. No more demons. No more demonic possession. No more sickness. No more confusion. Jesus sitting and reigning and ruling, shepherding the nations with a rod of iron. Can't you just wait for it? The world beautifully restored for the people of God. A restored world, a restored, restored land of Israel. Stupendous topographical changes you can expect. When Israel becomes flat as a plain and lifted up and elevated high above the nations, and the waters of the Dead Sea become cleansed, teeming with fish, and fishermen spread their nets at En Gedi. And the inhabitant will not say, I'm sick. Don't you want to hear that one day? Not like the faith healers try to convince people to say, I'm not sick. No, Jesus the Lord will cure all sickness and disease, and the inhabitant of the land will not say, I'm sick. Beautiful promises for the people of God. You know, friends, as you read Deuteronomy 4, you see several elements there, don't you? What are the elements that kind of jump out at you in Deuteronomy 4? How about this? A land for God's people. On and on it goes throughout that chapter. When you go into the land, don't behave like the pagans. God has a land for you. He's given you a land. A land for the people of God. That's a theme in Deuteronomy 4. Guess what else is a theme? Images. Images of the divine. Don't try crafting them for yourself. Stay away from making images of the divine. Love relationship is mentioned there in that chapter. God had love for the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, he loves their descendants and made promises to them too. Law is mentioned in Deuteronomy 4. You'll obey my commandments and statutes in the land that I'm giving you. Law is mentioned. Rebellion is mentioned. You will rebel against me, Israel. You'll adopt the practices of those pagans, and I will punish you. You'll be dispersed among the nations. Rebellion. And yet, promise of restoration in the latter days. Those elements dominate this chapter. You know what? Those elements dominate the entire book of Deuteronomy, the entire Pentateuch. In fact, it's a theme that winds its way through the whole Bible. In fact, you can pick this up for the first time in Genesis 1 to 3. Oh, in Genesis 1 to 3, don't you read about a land for God's people? It's called, it's called uh, Eden. Eden, the land for God's people. And you read about God's people, Adam and Eve, who are what? Images of the divine. They are made in God's image and likeness. And there's love relationship between God and his image bearers. And there's love relationship between those two image bearers. Adam looks at his wife coming down, coming down the aisle in the garden, the first marriage. There's father taking daughter to husband. Beautiful. And he says, this now at last. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Love relationship, a theme that dominates, see? And guess what else you have? Law. You may freely eat of all the trees of the garden, but you may not eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Law. Don't eat from that one. 
You have rebellion. Yes, they did eat. The man hearkened to the voice of his wife, and he ate. And guess what you have? Promise of restoration. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman will come and crush the head of that serpent once and for all. Guess what? If you're in Christ, you'll crush his feet too. That's Romans chapter 16, 19 and 20. All those elements, there they are. Grand themes of the Old Testament, grand themes of the entire Bible. It's a message of hope for Israel, friends, and a message of hope for the entire world. And I think you want to agree with Jesus, don't you? When he gives you an instruction on how to pray. Thy kingdom come. Jesus, come back. Please come back. I want him personally, legitimately, honestly, I want him to come back. It's not like my life is so horrible down here. I love my family. I love what I'm doing. I love all of you very much. You're dear to me. You're dear to our, to our family. It's not like it's so horrible for us, but when I think of heaven, when I think of the millennium, when I think of the restored heavens and earth, I just want him to come back. A fully restored world, land for God's people, that's the future. Filled with his image bearers, that's us. In love relationship with each other and with the, our God and our Redeemer. And his laws, finally at long last, written in our hearts, laws which we will obey from our hearts, with no temptation to sin, no deception from Satan, he will finally be consigned to the lake of fire forever and ever. The smoke of his torment will ascend forever. But you and I will inhabit heavenly Jerusalem, the capital city of heaven, a restored world, in fact, a new heavens and a new earth well indwells, wherein dwells righteousness forever. And I want to say with John the Revelator, even so, come, Lord Jesus, just come back. Come back and put an end to all the wickedness that's going on down here right now. Put an end to the wickedness that still resides in my flesh and in the flesh of my brothers and sisters. How many of us have just had enough? And we say, God, thank you for your Bible. Thank you for the promises that you've made. Thank you that you will make good on your promises. Thank you that you don't lie to people. You love us. You bear our sorrows. You've paid our sin debt. And you are truly wonderful. And you are one day going to make this world all that it's supposed to be in you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just want to pray, friends. Father God, in Jesus' precious name, we thank you, God, from our hearts that you are so kind to us. Thank you, God, that you have taken care of our deepest needs. You've paid our sin debt. You've made a way back to yourself. We thank you, God, that you don't, don't just wipe out a sin debt, but you bestow on us the righteousness of Christ that you make us the righteousness of God in him. We thank you, God, that you've made great promises to us about what we are going to be and about what the world is going to be. We thank you, God, that our struggles, our confusion, the pain we experience in our hearts and in our bodies will not go on forever. Death and sin don't get the last word. Jesus, you get the last word, and we praise you for it. Thank you, our great God. Thank you for the freedom, the privilege to come here and to be reminded of these life-changing truths. In your magnificent name, Jesus, we pray it all. Amen and amen. All right. All right. God bless you all.